Hi everyone, and welcome to Pi Data Manchester, um, February edition, and what is our first uh, first Pi Data Manchester event of 2021? Um, so it's exciting in that respect. Um, almost an entire year of of virtual meetups. Um, if you want to get in contact with us, and um, you can hit us on um, at Pi Data MCR, or you can join the Slack. Um, I believe there's a link to that in the video description. Um, and tweet along. Um, there's going to be some Slido, a Slido link as well in the descriptions if you've got any questions. So please do get involved um, and get involved in the chat that's um, happening in, in, in the Slack. And thank you as well to everyone who's been involved in the uh, the afternoon social in in the uh, in the Pi Data Slack channel. So um, who organises Pi Data Manchester? It's been a little bit. So behind the scenes today, Joe is organising the streaming um, and making sure that all runs smoothly. I'm John. Um, Jennifer and Sean are in the comments and um, around YouTube and Twitter and everything, trying to make sure um, everything goes smoothly and to answer any questions you might have and stuff like that. So we do have a code of conduct that it's really important everyone abides by. Um, Pi Data is a professional, um, you know, professional organisation. So all of the the way you conduct yourselves here should be the way you conduct yourself in a um, in a professional working environment. We take it very seriously. So if you've got any issues, um, uh, drop us a DM on Twitter, speak to any of the um, organizers, or you can use the anonymous support form here if there's any issues you want to call up. Um, if you've got any announcements that you think the broad Pi Data community can help with, if you've got a job, post it in the, um, in the jobs channel in Slack. If you're looking for a job, post it in the Slack. If you organize a meetup you want to give a special shout out to, again, post it in the Slack. We're more than happy to, to help um, shout anyone out. If you've got any questions or anything, then again, um, get in contact with Pi Data Twitter or any of the organizers and we'd be happy to help out as best we can do. As well, it's important we shout out um, our lovely sponsors without whom this wouldn't be possible. So Horsefly Talent Market Analytics um, and Cathcart Associates, as well, of course, as NumFocus, um, who helped throughout with the Pi Data stack um, and organizing these Pi Data events. And this evening, we're joined by uh, Dr. Julia Kazmir from the University of Manchester, um, who's going to be talking about agent-based modeling. Um, so I will pass you over to Julia now. Thank you very much, John. Um, yes, I will now bring up my slides because I am going to talk at you. Let's see if I can get this to work. Share this. Pop this up to full screen. And hopefully you should also see my subtitles because I'm trying to be inclusive and uh, accessible. Yeah, I can. Great, that's good. Um, Right, so today I'm going to talk to you about an introduction to agent-based modeling. Before I do that, I'll say a little bit about myself, so an introduction to me. Um, my name is Dr. Julia Kazmaier. I'm a research fellow with the UK Data Service and the Cathy Marsh Institute at the University of Manchester. What I do is teach computational social science, specifically to social scientists, um, that is essentially trying to get social scientists to try new computational and empirical methods that might be unfamiliar to them, but that help them answer questions in new and interesting ways. One of those ways, I suggest, is agent-based modeling. So let's dive in. Head first. Nose plugs on everyone, let's go. Walk you through the table of contents first so you're not frightened as I throw concepts at you. Starting off, I'm going to explain what systems are what top-down versus bottom-up is and how it relates to systems and also how it relates to problem solving. Following that, we'll focus on agents and agent-based models. I will give you an example throughout this, which is the telephone game. I'll explain that as it comes up. I'll then go on to the pros and cons of agent-based models, uh, some of the platforms and languages you can use to do agent-based modeling, and of course, uh, some resources that might be quite useful to you as you do agent-based modeling. Finally, there's some time at the end for question and answer, and I will actually go directly to um, an agent-based modeling program and I can work through some code live. I can maybe edit a couple of models and show you what's in the model library. Sort of have, have a real flavor of it. I use NetLogo, 
uh, primarily. So that's what I will show you. Right, diving right in, systems. What are systems? You think you know, maybe you do, but I'm gonna explain it anyway. A system is a set of variables sufficiently isolated to stay discussable while we discuss it. Now that sounds, you know, pretty um, unhelpful, frankly, but what's clear from this discussion, well, from this quote is that systems have multiple interdependent components. They have a boundary, which may or may not be absolute. They endure at least long enough for us to notice them and discuss them. They are organized in a way that uh, we can see as that differentiates them from everything outside of the system. And they have emergent properties or non-trivial behavior. Otherwise we wouldn't bother discussing it. Systems essentially are a collection of things that interact in a meaningful way in contrast to everything else around the system. What may not be quite so clear from this definition, but which is important, is that systems are an idealization. They're an observer dependent sort of contrast. We see something and we see it as interesting or as interdependent or as non-trivial. And we just, we differentiate it from everything around it. That is not absolute. The system doesn't really exist in the real world. It exists as a model, our perception of the real world. That sounds quite esoteric. We'll come on to it a bit later. Don't worry too much. So now the concept of, is it top down? So top down applies, this is a feature of systems where the system is, can be understood as whole and it's well understood and it has sort of a central control or structure. Systems like this, um, you know, something goes wrong in this system, we can see that there's a cause and then we can sort of isolate that cause and, and address it. And this is the kind of system in which a classic scientific method works well. It's a little bit hard to understand this, so, so it helps to look at some examples. Now, a really classic example of a top-down system or a problem within a top-down system is when something goes clunk in an engine. Now, people, not me specifically, but some people can view an engine as a top-down system. They see it as relatively simple, as composed of parts that they understand quite well with clear interactions. They can see it as isolated in that although fuel and new parts and cargo comes in and goes out of a plane, um, they can ignore all of that because they know a clunk in the system has nothing to do with who's currently piloting it right now. So they're able to simplify the system further, to isolate the problem within a subset of the system, to take it apart, replace the thing, build it back up. That's what makes a system top down. Another example is a prosthetic leg, at least in comparison to a real leg. Well, they're both real legs, but a sort of biologically functioning leg. The, the prosthetic leg has clear boundaries, has a fixed number of components, has clear functioning, all of the things that go into it don't change over time. The leg doesn't gain or lose weight the way a, a biological leg does, all of these kinds of things. And finally, Another example I've, I've chosen is a wind tunnel, which if you talk to fluid dynamicists will disagree. They'll say wind tunnels are incredibly complex, full of chaotic actions. But for the person who's operating the wind tunnel, for them, things get put in, the wind tunnel gets turned on, the data gets recorded, the things get taken out. So again, this is where the observer and the sort of perspective comes into it. Some people can see a system as simple, and top down, others will see it as complex and bottom up. So let's address that bottom up again. Is it bottom up? Bottom up systems are poorly understood. They have vague parts and unclear or inconsistent interactions. They're open or porous in that things are constantly moving in and out of them. And sometimes those things matter and sometimes they don't. They're only partial or decentralized control. Problems within bottom-up systems are really hard to break down into component problems that 
they don't behave linearly, they, they tend to be time and context independent. So the same set of circumstances sometimes creates problems, sometimes it doesn't. And the classic scientific method is really difficult to apply. Again, these concepts become a bit clearer with examples. So let's look at the most classic bottom-up example is a traffic jam. This is, you know, you can't point to a single car or truck or motorcycle within this traffic jam and say that's the problem for the traffic jam. If you remove that guy, the rest of the jam disappears. No, it, a traffic jam is an emergent problem because it, it arrives out of the interaction of all of the components, all of the cars, plus all of the road signs and the weather conditions and the way the junction is angled and the time of day and all of these things. Traffic jams are really hard to predict. They're hard to resolve. Sometimes they stay in one place, even though all the cars move. Sometimes the traffic jam will move backwards. It's really odd. Sometimes they'll disappear really suddenly, even though nothing has really changed. It's they're just bonkers, surprisingly bonkers, given how like normal a part of life they are. Another example is earthquakes. Now, earthquakes. Although we might think we understand the mechanics of, of what causes, you know, faults to slip. They're incredibly hard to predict. They're incredibly hard to isolate. There's, there's no very good, clear, linear relationships between where and when and how big an earthquake happens. You know, it's all just very, very complex. And my last example is uh, Castellers. These are sort of human towers, the competitive human tower competitions in Catalonia. And people who participate, they all know the rules, they all have the same shared purpose, but actually success or failure within these competitions is incredibly hard to predict because there's just so many components and all of those components are people and people are really hard to predict. They're just bonkers. So let's move on a little bit and say that if scientific sort of methods don't work very well, on, on these kinds of problems. You know, you can't recreate an exact traffic jam from one day to the next, the way you could in a lab try and recreate a particular um, engine failure. Instead, you have to build something that looks like a traffic jam. And if you can build a traffic jam in a model, then maybe you understand what causes real traffic jams. It's not guaranteed, but it's a better bet than just going, mm -hmm, I don't know, sometimes they happen. So intuition and classic scientific method don't work very well with bottom-up problems. You know, we don't, our, our good ideas about where traffic jams are likely to happen often don't match the reality of where traffic jams do happen. Likewise, earthquakes, castillers, you know, stock market crashes, what goes, what becomes a viral video. It's just really hard to predict any of these things. And likewise, they're very hard to recreate and study scientifically under controlled conditions in a lab. So instead, we do the next best thing, try and recreate it, often in a model. There are lots of modeling options available. You might suspect that I'm a big fan of agent-based modeling. You would be right. These kinds of models play around with lots of deterministic low-level rules. So to use the traffic jam, for example, everyone has um, low-level rules like how fast they can move, how much space they have to leave between cars, you know, how where they start and stop and you know how what time of day they try and, and travel along these paths. It's the interaction of all of these actors following these simple rules that create the emergent behavior finite parameters, like how many cars there are, how many will fit on the road, and varying, including extreme or counterfactual conditions, like maybe everyone absolutely needs to be at work within 10 minutes of nine o'clock. This is counterfactual. Most of us can be arrive early or late, but it's worth exploring these kind of bonkers, crazy conditions to see what happens. I put it to you that agent-based modeling is a good way of exploring these things. Um, so let's find out more. Let's look at agents, in fact. There are three common views about what agents are and how we can sort of use them. Now, one kind of agent is an artificial intelligence, and I've used the Terminator here as um, a sort of prototypical fictional example. They are 
generally considered to be autonomous. They're generally individuals and they seek to learn about or, or solve problems, a wide variety of problems. In contrast, multi-agent systems, like these little bots that try to collaborate to move around um, as a unit, they have distributed control and they generally try and solve specific problems. These are actually much more common in life than you might think. So if you have a, a house full of smart lights and smart speakers, they will work together to solve specific problems like playing the music where you are instead of in a room across the other house, you know, the other side of the house. Um, traffic lights tend to be distributed, multi-agent systems, you know, train crossings, all kinds of things like this are distributed multi-agent systems. And most importantly for us, agent-based models. They tend to have multiple agents who interact within a simulated environment. They tend to be quite rule-based. And they, you know, I've, I've given this example here. Um, they're sort of not very detailed. They're not very realistic. They can't generally solve lots of problems. They're meant to represent a particular situation like a traffic jam or maybe traveling to work on the train or, you know, um, epidemiolo epidemiology models tend to model sort of how easy it is for people to spread infections. So let's, because this is what this talk is about, let's go dive right into agent-based models a little bit more. They're generally a simulated world of varying richness and they include things like time, which because it's a computer has to move in discrete chunks. Now those chunks can be whatever you want them to be, days, weeks, years, whatever. They involve decision-making agents that have states and rules. They involve optional ob objects, which also tend to have states and rules. And I'll work, walk through an example um, of little agents playing the telephone game. Um, and I'll explain all of these as we go through because these are not always immediately obvious. So let's talk about the world. The world can represent just about anything. Whatever you want to model, in, as far as I know, you could make an agent-based model for. So it could be about modeling stock markets, um, how people move around a city, maybe within a room, like where the light is going to hit and therefore where temperatures might change. Whatever it is that you're trying to model, you probably can. And you generally want to put within that simulated world all of the things that you think matter to the problem you're trying to model. So if you're trying to model stock market prices, you probably want prices or things that you can buy or sell or companies that do the buying and selling. If you're modeling a city, maybe you want to include weather, street layouts, tram networks, things like that. If you're modeling a room, it's capacity, you know, whatever matters to your question. You want to include time and how it moves in discrete time steps, and you can set how time moves appropriately to your model. Again, so if you're modeling stock markets, maybe hours, maybe minutes, uh, maybe years, it depends on what kind of approach you're taking. A room would probably be hours or minutes. A city might be months, you know, it depends. But importantly, the world is unique to each agent because it includes everything in the model that is not that agent. So it includes all the other agents. So every agent is a part of the world for every other agent, as well as objects and, you know, sort of abstract things like the weather or the city layout that are true for all of the agents. And the world has states that are affected by and that affect the agents, the objects itself, random factors according to the rules. It'll become clear when I get to the part about explaining rules and states. But let's have a look at the telephone game. In this game, the world is quite abstract. It's just a bunch of little characters who are sat in a, they're organized in a three-dimensional space. There's nothing really in that space. It's just a blank space. However, there is noise in that space. And there are prizes to be won if you do well at the game. And this will come up again in the rules section. So for now, just know that games, that 
sorry, that models can have a very abstract world or they can have a very detailed, rich, realistic world. Depends on what you're trying to do. Don't put a lot of time and effort into making factors of the world realistic if it doesn't help you address your problem. So let's talk about agents now. They can represent just about anything, people, cars, ocean waves, you know, organizations, whatever. Those things can be dynamic, so they can appear and disappear, they can change, grow, shrink, age, change color, whatever. They are generally unique, at least in some ways, in that they have a unique position in the world and they have a unique sort of agent ID that the model can use to call on them in a different unique order. And they tend to behave uniquely because their world is unique. You know, they are the only thing in their world that is not true for everyone else. So they, they have a, a unique perspective that especially changes over time. They too have states that are affected by the world according to rules. And they make decisions. That's what separates them from objects is that agents make decisions about what to do based on the world, the states, the rules, the other agents. So let's look at the agents in the telephone game. In this game, they're little people. Here's one. And they have features like um, who number, that's their unique ID in NetLogo, it's called a who, got size, all of this stuff. They've also got things that matter for the model. Like in this case, he's got the word that he's thinking of now is written as two, two, two. It could be B, B, A or something like that. But in this case, it's two, two, two. They've got a position, they've got a color. So this is this particular agent and he's different from all these other agents. Okay, moving on to the next one, states. A state, more or less, is the sum of all the features, and it could apply to the world. So the sum of all the world features could apply to an agent. The agent state is the sum of all the agent features. You can also have like group states. So it's a, the sum of all features that matter for a group of agents, these kinds of things. Basically, anything that exists in the agent-based model has a state. They can be dynamic or static. Um, so in this model, for example, the agents change color over time as they win and lose prizes. And that means that their color is a dynamic state. They can be inputs and outputs. So agents might react differently to other agents based on their history of winning prizes. They might prefer agents that have won lots of prizes or they might turn away from agents that have won lots of prizes. So the state of you know, prize winning for any individual agent becomes an input into how other agents respond. And that is essentially how the agents use states to make decisions. They say, I want to find the nearest agent who has won at least 10 prizes. And they go looking around them, making decisions based on the states they can see. So in this case, you know, um, again, you know, you've got this particular agent state is a combination of his position, maybe his color, the word he's thinking of, you know, what, whether he's won lots of prizes. But the world state includes things like a current noise level, the current, how many prizes have been won overall in the game so far. And here we've got a distribution of the prizes won by players. So we can see that some players have won a lot of prizes and that other players have won very little. So now we come to the rules. And by now you probably can guess a little bit what I'm talking about with rules. So the rules govern how states change from moment to moment and how decisions are made. So they use model generated information, modeler choices, and some randomness, as well as the code that's written into the rules. They can be simple or complex. They can be sort of if then rules. They can be while rules. They can be for each rules. Basically all the usual kind of coding languages about how to make things happen apply in these rules as well. Here's a quick sample of some of the code for the telephone game. So, you know, for 
to go, it says set noise level at current noise level plus a random 10 minus a random 10. So this is a rule about how the world changes the noise level from one set to the next. It increases and decreases it at a sort of limited randomness. So it can keep going up if, if randomly, or it can go down or it can stay about the same. This is just part of the rules, you know, and um, also if one turtle who is currently playing asks another to participate, that's another rule. So one player asks another, let's play a game. This will make a bit more sense as we go on, but um, if, if you're used to coding in Python, then you'll certainly understand sort of if then while for loop rules. So let's take a look actually at the game. So this is in NetLogo, the interface tab, you'll see up here. And this is what happens when you open the game for the first time. So you'll see a setup button, you know, a current noise level and prize counter zero. No prize has been awarded because you've just opened this. There's also these little switchers, these little drop down menus, so you can change the layout, how the first player to, to play a game is chosen, how that player chooses the next player to invite to play, how many players are playing, game length, whether or not you consider the noise as a distortion, and what is an acceptable noise level. Beyond that noise level, distortion starts to affect how well they play the game. So that was the interface tab. This is the info tab. In theory, if it's a well-written um, game, it'll include thing, an explanation of what the game is about, or what, sorry, what the model is about, how it works, what features you should and shouldn't change. And finally, there's the code tab, which is the third tab within NetLogo. And this includes all of the code that actually guides how it runs. Now, modeler choices, so things like the layout, how the starter is chosen, what's an acceptable noise level. Let me just see if this, do let me know if the playing the video doesn't work. It does seem to be working, yeah. So I'm pointing out that- um, Oh, no, I can't see anything. You can't, okay. In that case, I'll move quickly through these um, slides with the, the video and we'll cover this in the, um, demonstration. So what I do want to say is that models run much more quickly than you might expect. So I mean, this took me, I don't know, two or three minutes to take, you know, thousands of time steps. And what's useful about that is things that we just can't quite expect, you know, we don't have good intuition about what kind of pattern distribution is going to happen in these games, just run it and see. And you can actually run it thousands of times. And um, that will let you get a really good spread of how many cases a given distribution occurs in, because there will always be some chaotic interaction that might um, really distort. Very rarely you might find everything goes black or very rarely everything goes white. Whereas most of the time you get a good spread between colors or something like that. Okay, so why an agent-based model? There are lots of other kinds of models that you might do to explore a bottom-up problem, but why an agent-based model? Well, I suggest that they're very good for outcomes that are not intuitive. So you think, you know, we, we want to reduce traffic jams at this particular intersection. What's the effect of putting up a sign here or moving the sign that's already there back a little bit or you know um, repainting the lanes but not actually changing anything will that have an effect we just don't know we're not very good at, at sort of imagining how thousands of people will interact with the thing thousands of times over the course of you know a, a week or a month or a year so build a model let the computational power do all of the take all the intuitive intuition out of it just see what happens so is doesn't necessarily help because we couldn't see the um, telephone game. Telephone essentially is, is Chinese whispers. And, you know, we it's not always easy to, to predict, for example, how noisy it has to be before people start losing the game consistently. Or what happens if we allow for 
random player starters or if players always want to play with people who are winners or if they specifically avoid playing with people who have won before you know all of these things might just affect the distribution of prizes in a game of of telephone but we're just not well equipped to kind of predict these things so the pros of agent-based modeling i'm going to say it, there's no need to rely on intuition for complex or long-term behaviors it's a good way to formalize mental models so that they can be inspected by others. So by building a game of how I think telephone goes or how a traffic jam goes or how a stock market goes, other people can look at my code and say, I agree with you on all of these points, except for this one, I disagree with you on that. Whereas if we're just talking in abstract terms, we can't really know how much we agree or disagree. So agent-based models, force you to be very explicit. The computer will not understand your hand wavy, vague ideas. They force abstract concepts to be represented concretely. So if I want to represent trust or, um, you know, sort of ambition or something like that in a model, I have to actually tell the model, this is going to be represented as a number between zero and 100, or this will be represented as, um, you know, a collection of three different numbers between zero and 100. You know, I, I have to formalize exactly what I mean. They are relatively cheap and easy ways to test untestable things. So for example, it is unethical to just infect people with diseases and see how the disease spreads throughout a population. But you can definitely infect an agent with a, a virtual disease and let it spread throughout a virtual population. That is not a problem. They are cheap and easy. Um, certain NetLogo is quite a lightweight program and you can run thousands or millions of repetitions uh, on a laptop, depending on how complex your model is. Quite easy, not a problem. They're potentially very, very fast. So I can see how a population reacts over virtual you know, dozens of years. I don't have to wait and observe a real world situation to see how things change slowly over time. I can simulate it very quickly. And I can show a range of possible futures. So by running the same simulation a thousand times, I can show how often a traffic jam occurs and how often it doesn't. So this says, you know, it's a bit like when we predict weather and say 70% chance of rain today because they ran lots of simulations and in 70% of them there was rain and in 70% there wasn't. It gives us better risk analysis than just saying this is possible or this isn't possible. You can run using real data, training data, random data, lots of things. So you can, you know, download historical patterns of stock market prices and feed that into the model and see if you can match the next step of, of the real historical data. So if you can get your model to generate what would be the correct step next, then that's a great way of testing your validating your model. Um, but you can also just do random things or you know potential um, counterfactual things. There's lots of options. You can run them again and again with or without changes. So you can really test things out in ways that are not ethical to do in the real world. And they can be very intuitive for non-specialists to understand. So if you show, for example, an epidemiological model of people moving around and you see them changing colors, they get infected. Um, it's very clear people looking at that and can say, can they can understand very viscerally, oh, I see how it works. Whereas it's it's maybe a bit abstract to talk about our numbers and risk of infection and, and sort of you know barriers to, to spread. You can just show in a model how it works, and that's very useful for under, for proposing and clarifying ideas with some audiences. On the cons, it is very hard to be critical of mental models and agent-based models based on them because um, we're all a bit abstract. Like it's it's very hard, specifically of our own mental models. We don't see our own logical flaws. We don't see that our own assumptions might not be warranted. We don't want to believe that other people who disagree with our method are based in reality. We tend to brush them off. And that's 
absolutely true of agent-based modeling as well. You know, a, a concrete representation that a computer understands may not be a very good representation of an abstract concept like trust or ambition. Um, the speed and ease with which models can be created leads lends themselves to being used for prediction and they are not actually very good for that but people want them to be and they are often used misapplied a bit possible futures are hard to turn into risk profiles because this a risk profile involves all kinds of things you can't model like how much we value avoiding something or how much we're willing to pay to fix something and that's that's outside the scope of the model, but people don't necessarily think about that when they look at modeling results. Give a false sense of security and truthiness because it's what the computer says no, you know, or computer says yes, and people, some people just really want to accept that. On the other hand, computational methods can motivate distrust in some people, no matter how useful and accurate and hard work your model is, they'll just be like, no, a computer did it and I'm not buying it, not even on double coupon day. And they're easy to misunderstand because they are so easy to interpret sometimes. People can get the wrong idea and run off with it before you've even explained all of the caveats of your model, which is true of science in general, but because agent-based models are quite easy to understand, sometimes it goes, it gets a bit too far. So let's talk about platforms and languages. Lots of them are free, open source. So they've got a small download size. There's good tutorials and information on the web because it turns out people who like agent-based modeling are big on open science. So yay. Um, a couple of options you might look at. Mason repassed NetLogo. It's the one that I'm going to demonstrate soon. EML Lab Agent Spring. And then of course you can create agent-based models with just object-oriented software like Python. That's very powerful, but it's not as specialized. So especially if you're just starting up with something, you may not be able to find resources and examples of how to, to do what you're trying to do. So Wikipedia page on agent-based modeling and a Wikipedia comparison of various agent-based modeling software platforms. So if you're interested, dive right in there. Um, there's also a very good repository of researchers who've made the models that they've built available on uh, openabm or comcess.net. I have at least, I don't know, half a dozen models up there if you want to look at my code, including this telephone game. In summary, bottom up sort of systems and the problems with this in them are non intuitive, they're large scale, uh, it's a big consequence of many small interacting acts. Agents are heterogeneous actors that observe, decide, and act. Agent-based models are bottom-up simulations with easy testing functionality. The pros are that they are inspectable, cheap, easy, fast, and you can ethically do experiments that would otherwise be unethical. The cons are that they it inevitably simplifies complex things, and that might miss, miss the point of some problems. They're often misused for prediction and they can be easy to misunderstand. Uh, a couple of references here. Um, oh, there's one. The quote at the beginning came from this um, article by Ryan. Um, there's an agent based modeling of socio technical systems. I'm co author on two chapters, I highly recommend. And uh, download and tutorials for NetLogo are available in Northwestern EDU. So, that is the end of my presentation portion and we can take some questions and then I can move into uh, demonstrating the, the NetLogo software. You can really see like how you pick, how you make modeler choices, how you run the model, things like that. I'll stop sharing my screen um, and we can... Yeah. Move... yeah. Thank you very much for that, Julia. Yeah, sure. I feel like I've talked a lot at you. <laughs> so, no, really. um, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to take a little bit of a break, let people have a stretch, you know, get a drink of water, ask me some questions. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a few questions from the YouTube chat. Great. Um, so 
can you inject stochastic events in NetLogo? For example, with COVID, this might be, might be uh, dynamically changing restrictions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It depends on whether you want those events to be like sort of semi-random. So in the telephone game, for example, I had the option to randomly choose the next player or to randomly mm. choose from players that have high or low prize scores. So there is some randomness built directly in. But you can also um, sort of let events within the model trigger changes to the global rules. So, for example, you could say if the R number comes over 1.2, then enact another lockdown, at which point um, laws come into effect where people are only allowed to move so far or mm. you know leave the house once a day or whatever it is. And so, yeah, you can let, you, you could also just let, properly random things happen you know um if our number goes to three then everyone turns blue and starts running around like crazy or you know something else you know it depends on on the logic that you want to test so is that the kind of thing that for individual agents you might rather than setting hard and fast rules or a statement you might say okay there's a probability distribution of actions you might take yes absolutely and because the agents are heterogeneous you can set them all to have different rules to follow so mm. some people might be good rule followers and some might be sneaky cheats and mm. some might be um you know curtain twitchers who are reporting everyone and other people are just really oblivious and they're not reporting anyone so you know it's yeah you can absolutely set a lot of things to be very different and that's you the effort that you put into that kind of of rule creation and and heterogeneity in your agents depends on what you're trying to model. So if you're trying to model, for example, the influence of, you know, whether your neighbor's reporting you as a deterrent, you want to really focus on deterrent behavior and, and sneakiness and doziness. Whereas if you're trying to sort of investigate um, infection rates, that's probably, it's not as important. So you might collapse it into just good rule followers and less good rule followers. And, you know, people who report their neighbours would be, equal, you know, the, whatever score they have on that would also affect how conscientious they are about social distancing or mask wearing or staying out. Yeah, so, I mean, it's one of those, if you're not going to, you don't want to get too complex unless it's exactly related to the question you're, you're asking. Yeah, the, the more realistic you make your model, obviously, the more useful it is for addressing realistic questions but also the slower it runs and the harder it is to see the impact of any individual change. So you really yeah. have to balance what you want to get out of it versus what you put into it. That makes sense. So, um, so I, I guess this is kind of on a similar theme. Um, a question from Rebecca D, I assume Rebecca Davey. Um, Hey Rebecca, thanks for talking last time. Um, are there any ways we can validate that we've set a, um we've set realistic agent rules? So, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole complicated process about how you develop them. Obviously, you can just pull ideas out of your head and, and build a model on it and see what happens. That's fine. You can do a lot of interviewing and sort of desk-based research to see what other people think happens, and you can build rules, agents that reflect those rules. Um, and then if you want to validate, you can, of course, you know, present your, your outcomes to experts. You can compare your outcomes to historical or, or real world patterns. Um, you can get other people who disagree with you to build their own model and you can compare them. You know, there's all kinds of ways to validate. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a bit difficult, because, partly because it's still a relatively new field and people are a bit suspicious about it especially people who've never worked with it are like, ah, you and your computers get out of here. And that, that's quite frustrating, but <laughs> you have to be prepared that some people will just dismiss it right out. Yeah. Like, there's no way to validate this nonsense. Just there is. So, I mean, taking that a step further, and this may be kind of, I, I don't know if this is possible, um, but the, another question we've got is from a machine learning perspective, um, you know, if you're using a random forest classifier or something like that, you might go into hyperparameter optimization. So you know you've got the model pretty good, but there's lots of optimization you can do. Is yeah. that something to be done with um, with agent-based modeling? And if so, 
how. <laughs> yeah, you can really tune your parameters. The thing is you can um, set up a parameter sweep of experiments and then set it to run automatically and then you analyze your data and mm. you can find clusters in the output. So you could say, you could, for example, find that you get very clear patterns when the starting player is chosen randomly, but the subsequent players are chosen based on um, affinity for people who've already won a game. You know, that's going to tilt the outcome into a particular trajectory that, that produces certain patterns. And you might find that that's more or less sensitive to starting player choice and that really second player choice matters most or, um, you know, that, or the other way, or that they both have to go together. And you can, you can identify these kinds of clusters of pattern in the output. Um, I would also say for machine learning, you can build machine learning into the agents so that the agents learn over time, oh, cool. which is, yeah, <laughs> really juice those agents up. Um, obviously in a, a very sophisticated set of learning agents, especially if there's lots of learning agents, you would probably want to do in a more powerful language than NetLogo. NetLogo is reasonable. I built a model where um, company owners would buy and sell equipment for their companies based on what their neighbors were doing, what they observed so was successful for their neighbors. So mm -hmm. they did a kind of learning. They also communicated with each other and gossiped essentially about what worked well. And that was a kind of learning and I had hundreds of agents and they did this over thousands of timestamps. But if you want millions of agents who learn very sophisticated things over millions of timestamps, you probably don't want NetLogo for it. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds pretty, pretty intensive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like if you're trying to model people who like smart energy meters, for example, those are obviously learning sort of devices. There's a lot of smart stuff going on in, in smart energy meters, There's mm. millions of them, and they're making calculations every, I don't know, 10 seconds at the minimum. So, you know, that's a huge amount of computational power. You would want a more sophisticated language for that. But it's also a very interesting way of seeing which way that the whole chaotic system, like how that tips. And um, yeah, you might get some really interesting insights by combining learning, agent learning with agent interactions. Mm. Um, yeah, so you did mention this slightly in, um, in your talk about what kind of things can, well, you, what kind of things agent-based models should be used for um, or what kind of things they shouldn't. So can you go into a bit more depth of what agency's yeah. models are not good for? Yeah, they are not good for creating precise predictions of specific real world situations. And that is in fact what people want them to be good for and they are not. Um, because the real world is just so deeply rich and complex and has no boundaries really. Whereas an, an agent based model does have boundaries and is not particularly rich and complex, not compared to the real world. You have to, for example, um, a friend of mine built a model to test whether carbon trading schemes or a carbon tax was more effective in reducing total carbon levels within Europe over a certain time frame. And it, it was quite conclusive. His results showed carbon tax all the way, every time, just do it. But people didn't really want that answer. They wanted carbon trading schemes to be the answer. So they kept like kept asking him to to predict something else, you know, and it just it's just like, well, what if we did this with trading schemes? And it's, like, <laughs> yeah. it's it it's not good at predicting how if you keep changing the trading scheme, how it might react. Because that is, in fact, exactly what people are going to do is they're going to find new ways to scam it. They're going to find new ways to change the rules and say, OK, points for you, except this time and then extra bonus now and, uh, you know, extra ones at Christmas. And <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And, and you win more and more chaos in that. Yeah. Yeah. People are full of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> you open up a drawer full of chaos. I mean, my drawers anyway. <laughs> Um, so I think probably the last question before we go on to um, demo, sure. um, you've hinted at it, 
has this been used to model COVID-19? And you know, can you tell us a little bit how? Um, yes, I seem to remember someone did an agent-based model. They didn't make their code um, available, which is a shame, but they did mm. model how um, social distancing, masks, and um, sort of hand washing and, and sort of limited numbers in shops would affect in um, rates. That was, I think, fairly early on. And so maybe didn't account for some of the aerosol transmission they believe is happening now. Um, but yeah, people have absolutely done a lot of epidemiological models and some COVID-19 for sure. In fact, I can show you, um, I'll go ahead and present my, I'll go with, Oh, hang on, it won't only give me the option of entire screen, not window. Ah, a window, there we go. Um, net logo. So this is my net logo. Let me make it big so that you can all see. And I will open up the models library. These are models that already exist. They're well tested and functional. Um, and we'll look at these, I think it's biology, epidemiology should be in here. No, doesn't look like it is. There's absolutely loads of these models. They're already existing. You can you can open them up, play around, edit the code. Maybe it's social science. Should have uh, tested this before I came. Wiki um, networks, maybe. Virus on a network. Let's see what that one is. Spread of a virus through a network. So let's go with that. Generally, I mean, there are the info and the code tabs. So you can snoop right in there if, if you like. But a good option is always just hit setup and then hit go. And you'll see it do its thing. And this might not make a whole lot of sense to you at first, but reading the info tab will help. So we can see the susceptible, infected, and resistant. So we can see these sort of numbers sort of converging and separating over time. And there are all, of course, features here like virus spread chance, virus check frequency, recovery chance. You know, uh, it's hit a plateau. It's done a thing. And that's where essentially the infected number fell to zero and the virus died out in this case. So we could see what might happen if we change these. So instead of people being on average having a, a node degree of six, we could put it up to 11, set up. It's a much more densely connected network. I bet it's all gonna go red really quickly. Uh, whoop, there it goes. <laughs> um, but then we can see how the recovery rate interacts. And of course we can check, we can change things like how frequently people are tested, you know, what's their chance of recovery, uh, what's their chance of gaining resistance? And we can play around with these times, these sliders to change. Um, and we can see like maybe how quickly we can get this virus to disappear, you know, and that might be quite unrealistic or might, we might try and set these things very realistically and then see how long it takes to disappear. It kind of depends on what um, questions you want to ask to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, even for something as simple as this, you can see the importance of social distancing with the social. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, essentially social distancing is saying like, right, everyone's going to drop their number of nodes down to, well, let's say the number of nodes, absolutely the highest we can put it. But let's put the average number down to, you know, three set up. That's a very different network. Uh, we're gonna, it's, it would have a very different um, spread. We can just see whoop, it's just sort of piddling about, died out really quickly. So, yeah, have a play around. And then, of course, it's quite easy to um, edit these if you want. Like trivially, I could just say rather than setting the default circle shape to circle, I could say square and interface setup and other squares. Yeah, so that's it's. That logo is quite good in that its language is a bit like Python. It's it's, it's logical for English speakers. It sort of makes sense. Mm. We can we can understand it. But there is a very good online net logo dictionary that you can search. That includes like all of the different 
sort of primitive code that you can build your own code from and what what the proper grammar is so where you want parentheses or com colons and things like that mm -hmm. yeah um i'm happy to you know we can look at some other models um i do not want to take those changes so um biology is quite a good one i'll go with wolf sheep predation so this is um this is one about how if you have a field and the sheep are eating the grass and it takes a certain amount of time for the grass to regenerate and the wolves are eating the sheep and the sheep only breed at a certain rate and all of these things are controllable what happens do we end up with you know sheep overrunning do the wolves kill them all off do the sheep starve because they've eaten all the grass you know it's whoop, uh, all the wolves disappeared and now the sheep are back you know going strong and they've uh, killed themselves by overeating so you know quite uh, the sheep have inherited the earth so there you go there's i mean this is not a hugely difficult model but you know it's certainly not the kind of thing that we would have good intuitions about at what point the wolves would die or mm. how many sheep could survive once the wolves outnumbered the sheep and then you know they started starving off these are just not the kinds of things that we can have good intuitions about so it's much better to build a model and let it do with the intuiting mm. i mean it, so is it relatively easy because there is a there is a inbuilt randomness in this if we reran the simulation many many times you yes. get a distribution of different outcomes yes absolutely i mean i can go ahead and run it again and you'll see um you can also like play around and you can see like if the initial number of wolves is 51 does that change it mm. uh and see this time whoop it all went wolves so that's quite a different outcome uh and everyone dies so yeah, just two two things, exact same settings, very different outcomes. Mm. That's yeah. really yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> that's just why I'm so enthusiastic about this. <laughs> because everyone, in fact, has these kinds of questions where they're like, you know, who would win a shark or a bear in a fight? Uh, well, model it, you know. <laughs> you might win an argument down the phone <laughs> when we're allowed to go back to posts and arguing yeah don't remind me <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there's there's absolutely loads and then if you're interested in um building models it's also quite useful to see um so the sample models and the curricular models are sort of established well-functioning things that you can look at to see how things are done there's also code examples which are not they're well functioning but they don't really run as a full model it's something like how you get uh, agents to travel along a line you might use this if you're trying to build a model of um, a tram network for example you can there's also often a go which is to run infinitely or to mm. go once if you just want to see step by step where do they go what happens so in this case you would go to the code and you might say oh i'm gonna copy all of this to my model and change the name from circle to you know change the shape from circle to train and make it a tram network model instead mm. yeah that seems relatively you know nice thing to get started with yeah, it's really, it's it's almost like they really want you to use it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very good. It's very well set up. And NetLogo is certainly sufficient for a lot of research. All of my published research with agent-based models has used NetLogo um, because I tend to do fairly small, abstract sort of thought experiment kind of things. Um, mm. But if you want to, for example, model the electricity grids in Europe, um, things like EML Labs Agent Spring. That was one that I showed in the, the slide deck. That is really properly built to scrape websites like Wikipedia, I think, which shows the position, size, power outage, and fuel type of uh, energy hubs like producers, gas plants, and, and hydroelectric dams, and things like that. Puts it on a map 
and then you can see the electricity flowing around. It's just, there's some amazingly detailed things out there. Yeah, it's fascinating. Very powerful stuff. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else has questions or if everyone's just completely bobbled. There's any more questions in the chat. Um, <laughs> so uh, another question from Tariq. Um, is it useful to combine agent modeling with genetic algorithms to help evolve the agents? Yeah. And I would say that there are some good examples in here, I believe, in biology. That would make sense. Uh, maybe not. Um, the computer science might have them. Simple genetic algorithm, absolutely. I'll open this one up. And um, it's, a, you can see in this case, they've put a very small world. You can set up uh, and go. And you can see these different algorithms, you know, raw fitness, diversity, you know, it, in this case, it probably helps to really explore the info and code tabs to see what's going on. But um, yeah, in this case, they've combined genetic algorithms and agent based modeling to show exactly how mutation rate, um, population size, you know, fitness, how, how those relate. Mm. Cool. I yeah. can imagine how you could combine them. I, I'd imagine you could combine them for some pretty, pre, pretty specific problems if you want to understand. If you want to understand, I don't know what population stress is, how they affect them, or something like that. Yeah, I mean that's also another. Like, um, you could have the agents learn how to do things better over time. You can have mm. the agents, you know, that have silly solutions to their problems. They can just die out and be replaced by other agents that maybe have better solutions to problems. And you can agents. There is a function of hatching or spawning agents so you can mm. have an agent essentially clone itself and then you can have that agent it's its clone make minor small changes to itself before it starts interacting so you can you can absolutely do that kind of genetic algorithm um so sort of, for example um, new agents in a covid simulation could say okay rather than one meter social distance we'll have two meters social different distance yeah yeah and yeah, you can have the rules can change in that kind of genetic algorithm way. You can have the agents change, you can have both. And mm. it's, you know, that you might, for example, find someone who finds a sneaky way to get around the rules. Um, like, uh, what was it, the scotch egg or something like that? <laughs> yeah, the substantial meat scotch egg meal. <laughs> so you might, if you were trying to model businesses and how they can stay open under these restrictions, you might have one of them come up with a scotch egg rule and then that would mm. be successful and all of its neighbors would then copy its scotch egg rule and then infection rates might respond to that. And you can see how you, it goes. You can, you can uh, model out these things under different scenarios and different pressures and stuff. Yeah, oh. yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess on a similar note, um, is it common for existing data to be used to inform the behavior rules of agents and their environments? So I guess that'd be like setting up a, a prior, using prior information to, to inform the decision. Yeah, absolutely. And how much it informs or how directly it informs comes down to what you're trying to model. But for example, um, uh, psychology, for example, you might, well, that one's not quite what I was thinking, but probably social science. You might say um, traffic, uh, yeah, there's some traffic ones here. And so you would have good research saying that most people follow the speed limit, but maybe that 20% are willing to go five miles an hour above and mm. another 20% are willing to go up to 20 miles an hour above or something like that. And you could build that into your model. You could say, I'll use that real research on how many people follow the rules and how strictly they follow to inform the distribution of behaviors in my model. Mm, cool. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think the last question, um, how would you test a video of the validity of this kind of model? Is it something you'd observe to real life? Yeah. Um, again, it, exactly how you validate depends on the question you're trying to address and the model you've built, but um, a couple of good ways. 
I mean, the easiest way I found is to present it to people who consider themselves experts and try and convince them to say, yeah, it makes sense. Hmm. Um, while the easiest, that's maybe not the most useful uh, or the most convincing for the general population. Um, replicating historical patterns is a good one. So in that case, if I could build a model of a stock market that shows the same kind of peaks and dips and, and patterns mm. that real stock markets do, I could say, look, my stock market, the rules I've built into my market are sufficiently similar to the real world that we get the same basic kinds of output. You could um, try and exactly model a specific situation. So if you had a street map and you're trying to say exactly what conditions do we get traffic jams on this street? Then, mm. you know, you could uh, both observe the real street and build the model and see how closely they match up. Um, I suppose it's, it's difficult if you got, uh, in, certainly for some of the ABMs you're describing, they can basically have infinite outcomes. So, yeah. so yeah. there's not like a defined space in which to say, okay, this is, this is, you know, within, this is correct, you know, with the label or this is, there's an error of whatever, not by not. So, yeah, yeah. It sounds, yeah it sounds you, like you can it produce the error bars and you can say, you know, um, that's that's one of the benefits of sort of running the same model, like our, our wolf sheep predation model, we ran it two times and got two mm. completely different outputs, right? In that case, we probably need to run that a thousand times and see, do the sheep win 70% of the time and the wolves 30 mm. or um, 70, 20 and 10% of the time they come to some kind of a sustainable balance where it goes up and down but neither ever totally wins mm. um you know and you'd, you'd have to report those kinds of things you'd have to say 70 percent of the time under a variety of starting conditions the sheep always win because sheep are just you know they're troopers um yeah you, you, it depends on how complex it is how many possible situations there are that you're trying to model mm. and also how how diverse your starting conditions you will allow are um, because it might be that sheep win 100% of the time as long as there's at least 50 sheep at the start mm. you know there might be some kind of weird parameter setting that matters to the outcome it all sounds very chaotic in it does. No sense <laughs> yes uh, that's that's one of the reasons I like it because the world is chaotic mm. and um, this is a way to capture that it, it's it's not the same as just arguing that if we make this change people will react this way we know that it doesn't work we know that people always react in completely unexpected ways and then we're shocked about it <laughs> yeah at least this way we can start to understand some of the randomness or anticipate some of the distributions of randomness at the end yeah yeah okay uh, i mean that's very difficult so people don't want to hear that <laughs> Very scientist, but maybe we'll understand that a little bit under some yeah. circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much, Julia. Yeah, sure. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, yeah, um, feel free to add more questions into YouTube, carry on the discussion in Slack. And, you know, yeah. um, any questions for Julia or the rest of the you know, community, um, pop them on, on Twitter. Yes, cool. indeed. Um, Thank you very much, and we'll see everyone in March. Okay. Um...